क्या प्रॉब्लम थी तो मुझे कैसे पता चलेगा कि दे आर लिसनिंग या हाउ विल दे रिस्पॉन्ड सर आफ्टर द एंड ऑफ द चैट सर यू कैन गो प्लीज क्लिक ऑन क्लिक हियर हां दिस वन राइट सर हां दे राइट हियर सर कमेंट बॉक्स देयर रोल नंबर थ्री नेम एजेंट सर समथिंग लाइक दिस दे आल्सो आस्क क्वेश्चंस फ्रॉम दिस सर ये तो बड़ी पुरानी फोटो आ रही है This is your photo. No, no. it's a very old one. Let me see. No, 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 sir. Twenty percent is there. So I hope you can hear me. Of course, I have no way of knowing that you can. So when we are done, we will take you on the. Uh, we'll do some questions. Agar suniye. Agar beech mein koi question karna ho, to kar sakte hain. There is no beech mein question karne ke. Sir, agar koi question karna chah raha hai, aap se sir, aapko Google Chrome pe jaate. Wait. Vertigo has two definitions, which basically means there are two kinds of vertigo. 
the commoner one the usual one is the hallucination of motion or the false sensation of motion and the second one is the disagreeable sensation of loss of spatial orientation so we'll examine this further and we'll see as to how one comes to a diagnosis so as i said multi speciality origins and there are many many specialties which can give rise to vertigo but it's basically an issue of the vestibular system and its central connections and its nutrition so the causes can be broadly divided into the causes from the ear causes because of the neurological connections and the vestibular nucleus and causes because there is not enough nutrition to the vestibular nucleus which is basically the medical causes so what are the autological causes one which is often talked about and we will see this as we go further is what we call as benign paroxysmal positional vertigo bppv benign paroxysmal positional vertigo then there is endolymphatic hydrox endolymphatic hydrox is the correlate of glaucoma in the from the point of view that there is increased pressure in the inner ear and we call it endolymphatic hydrox or meniere's disease there is vestibular neuronitis this is not quite necessarily a neuronitis of the eighth nerve but this is a clinical syndrome which is so called because it presents as a sudden loss of function of the eighth nerve or the vestibular nerve we like to presume it's always because of a neuronitis but sometimes there can be other causes nevertheless if somebody has isolated vertigo which is long lasting that's a diagnosis labyrinthitis is very similar except that it involves the hearing functions too so it is a vertigo with hearing function problem with hearing loss and there are other causes which you don't need to get too worried about but it's nice to be aware i'm sure your textbooks will have these all listed but as a broad reason there's the autological the ear causes then there are the neurological causes the neurological causes the ones that you really need to worry about are the vascular causes which is usually migraine migraine can cause vertigo but often it is also vertebro basilar insufficiency which may present either as a transient ischemic attack or as cerebrovascular accident that is a stroke it can be because of epilepsy it can be because of medicines it can be for a lot of other reasons then there are the medical causes the medical causes are because there is not enough nutrition to the to the vestibular nucleus so again this may occur because you are anemic this may occur because you are hypoglycemic this may occur because you have an arrhythmia this may occur maybe because you are having some medicines this may occur if you hyperventilate and you get hypocarbia and that upsets some of the metabolism in the in the in the brain and you can sitting out there do some hyperventilation and you will start to soon very quickly very quickly you start to feel that you are going a little bit dizzy there is also among the miscellaneous causes something that we call the multi sensory deficit syndrome which basically means that for our balance we need our eyes we need our inner ear which gives you the sense of spatial orientation you need our joints and sometimes there are people as they get older who don't quite have good vision because they have cataracts or because they have other issues with their eyes who don't have good joint proprioception because they have got osteoarthritis and may also have issues with inner ear aging and so gen generally get up in a situation where they don't quite get the inputs that you need to balance yourself and you have someone who's aged in your family you might find that they are a little bit dizzy especially when they stress themselves into unfamiliar situations which is because they have this kind of situation happening with them so this is an important slide look at it again autologic causes neurological causes medical causes and then we will take it further from here so how do you approach among all these many causes what your patient may have you basically need to go through these four basic questions and we will take you through these four basic questions and then we'll do some case studies so question 1 you need to ask yourself is this vertigo because a lot of vertigo is not quite vertigo we define vertigo as being a hallucination of motion or a sensation of loss of spatial orientation so often times vertigo gets confused with dizziness which is a more diffuse symptom dizziness means thoda sa light headedness thoda chakkar not quite sure kya ho raha hai sir ghoom raha hai sir pe andhera chha raha hai you know all those kinds of issues feeling of darkness blackness and uh, 
that is not vertigo so a lot of dizziness is not vertigo a lot of dizziness is actually syncope or pre syncope pre syncope means that they are not getting enough blood supply to their brain there is a little bit of a overlap between this and the medical causes of vertigo actually the medical causes of vertigo are these so these patients don't quite have a sensation of things swirling round and round they have a sensation of a bit of light headedness they have a sensation of feeling dizzy feeling weak feeling maybe a bit hungry and uh, as they say a bit of darkening or andhera chha jana chakkar aana so that kind of situation is what they call as a syncopal syndrome and that often is quite common if somebody is uh, anemic somebody is hypovolemic ladies can get there because they can be both if they are having menorrhagia they can be both anemic and hypovolemic and they may feel a little bit of dizziness if you have a diarrhea you might feel a little bit of pre syncope or syncope if you're having some medicines which decrease your blood pressure you might feel some syncope or pre syncope and that is not quite classical vertigo so so when you see a patient the first question you need to ask if he says chakkar aa raha hai to re examine the whole issue as to whether this is actually a hallucination of motion is this a disagreeable sensation of loss of spatial orientation the kind of situation that occurs with the multi sensory deficit syndrome or the kind of situation with occurs if you have too much streptomycin and lose in a ear function on both sides and uh, so you need to see where you are and accordingly make your diagnosis so basically what this slide is saying is rule out syncope there are other causes of course it could be epilepsy which is also a periodic uh, syndrome and may sometimes be confused with vertigo or syncope but if you take a good history there is really no reason to get confused as i said is not ataxia because ataxia is a motor symptom paralysis is a motor symptom cataplexy is a motor symptom they are not vertigo vertigo is a sensory symptom so first question you ask is is it vertigo once you've been through that question is it vertigo you go to the second question is it the most important question that is this autologic or neurologic so as you said the first question basically took away the medical causes or the hematological causes or the endocrine causes because they are present with pre syncope and once you have taken away that then you need to focus on whether you are looking at an autological causes which is basically what we call peripheral or whether you are looking at a neurological cause which is what we call central so how do you take an answer to that question so some very basic physiology this physiology you should know so there are the afferents in how we balance ourselves with the central processing in how we balance ourselves and there's the efferents in how we balance ourselves so just let us examine this thing so how do i you and i perceive as to whether we are straight or whether we are bent to one side whether we got our head bent to one side or head back how do we perceive as to whether the plane we are traveling in is bent to one side tilted to one side or whether it's straight how do we perceive when we are in a swing as to whether we are going up or down how do we perceive that we are moving forward or backward we do it by many ways so the afferents are of course the visual afferents all of us have eyes open so we can see a lot in the eyes and tell as to whether how we are orientated we have the vestibular afferents which is basically the balance sensor or the sensor gravity sensor or the motion sensor which exists in the inner ear which has two bits the semicircular canals and the sacral and the vest and the utricle which tell you as to whether you are where gravity is pulling you if you are like this then your utricle becomes active if you are straight then your utricle is less active when you are like this then your left utricle becomes active when you bend to the right the right utricle becomes active similarly when you turn your head the semicircular canals become active if you turn your head to the right the right semicircular canal is stimulated you turn your head to the left the left is stimulated there is a basal uh, neural activity to all these semicircular canals so when you turn to the right the right is hyper stimulated and the left is less stimulated so basically visual afferents vestibular afferents and then proprioceptive afferents which tell you as to whether your joints are bent or straight whether you're leaning forward on your back whether your head is back or your head is front afferents so all the afferents take up the information by which we perceive the environment and our own relation to the environment this is processed in the head and then it goes out to efferents so what are the efferents there is the eye efferents so if i feel i am being pushed to the right if i am jumping to the right if i am pushed to the right 
my eyes will automatically turn to the left so that I can keep a steady gaze on whatever I was looking at. If I'm in a car and things are moving, my eyes will automatically adjust so that I can always look at the same point that I'm looking at on the road. Similarly, the visual symptom gives me the exactly same system. We, get, we call it the pursuit system. And that is one of the motor afferents of, uh, efferents of our perception of the environment. We have the spinal motor system so that if I feel I'm turning, I'm falling to the right, it will automatically make my right-sided muscles more active so that I correct myself and come back to the left. Similarly, the cerebral cortex where I will perceive that motion and the autonomic system Wherein in severe stimulation, I might quite feel a little bit nauseous, as tends to happen when we go on a merry-go-round or something by excessive stimulation. So another key slide, eh? So is it vertigo? Is it central or peripheral? Once you have come this far, you've got a full understanding of how to diagnose and treat vertigo from now on. In this order, you first ask the question, is it vertigo? If you answer that, you ask the next question, is it central or peripheral? And now let us see how you answer that question. So you've just seen some physiology. Now imagine there's something going wrong in the vestibular afferent. If something goes on in the vestibular afferent, then everything that is downstream will get affected and will get affected in proportion. So whatever be the stimulus in the vestibular, it will, it will affect the vestibular nucleus and the reticular formation and it will affect all the efferents in proportion. If by contrast you had a problem in the vestibular nucleus, then it may affect just the oculomotor system or it may affect just the spinal motor system. So what happens is that when you have a problem in the peripheral system or in the ear or in the vestibular system, then all these four systems are affected and affected in proportion. So that is a very important thing to realize, in proportion. So these patients will feel a hallucination of motion, they will feel things are going round and round. They will feel nausea and vomiting which will come with it invariably unless it's very mild and they will have nystagmus. So nystagmus is the manifestation of the oculomotor reflex which will come into which will come into play because the body is perceiving that you are moving. The body is perceiving that you are moving and so automatically it will set the eyes to move for you and they will all be in proportion. If it was a central system they may not be in proportion. So now let's look at it a little bit deeper. The nystagmus which you get with uh, mm -hmm. So I'm sorry you can't quite see that. This was a key slide. I'll see if I can show it to you. So I'll just show you what is uh, exact peripheral nystagmus looks like. This is what peripheral nystagmus looks like. So if you look at these eyes, these guys are getting involuntary uh, movements and these movements are basically jerk movements, what we call unidirectional and jerk. So you can have nystagmus which may be uh, in uh, both directions and you can have nystagmus which may be equal in both directions but here what you see is a smooth unidirectional movement which we would call right beating. So basically what is happening is that the, there's a sudden fast pace of the right and then a slow correction phase on the left and then a fast pace of the right and a slow correction phase on the left. So right beating nystagmus and right beating nystagmus which is unidirectional you have one direction and which has a jerk component, fast in the slow phase. So if you have this, you call this a peripheral type of vertigo or a peripheral type of nystagmus. So you, there are many other kinds of nystagmus but you really don't need to get bothered about them because all you need to know is the classical peripheral nystagmus and anything that is not classical peripheral is by corollary not peripheral and central. So, um, so sorry. Eh? 
So these are the other kinds of nystagmus. So this is not a jerk nystagmus. It works on both sides. Super it's naked. not unidirectional. So that's a little bit right beating, a little bit left beating, and what we call as a pendular nystagmus. There's no jerk component to it. Here's another gentleman, right beating left beating, direction changing in the same position. That is not peripheral. Here's another nystagmus. This is doesn't have any particular sign. It is actually to work by her removing fixation if it is a demyelinating disease in the cerebellum. So all of this is central nystagmus and you don't need, need to get bothered. As far as you are concerned, you only need to get bothered about the fact that, that uh, nystagmus which is unidirectional with a fast and a slow component is a peripheral nystagmus and anything else which is not so is a non-peripheral nystagmus. So anything that is unidirectional fast beating with a fast and low with a slow and a fast phase and unidirectional is peripheral, everything else is not. So this is the same lady as you can see she also has a taxi associated with it, which also is inhibited by her tensing her muscles and her fixating her eyes. So we get back to our slides. What is central nystagmus? Central vertigo, how is it different from peripheral vertigo? So they can get exactly the same symptoms. They will have what, rotatory vertigo, but oftentimes they will not have a very classical things going round and round or swirling, twirling around. They might be just having some mild imbalance and things may not be in proportion. So they may have rotatory vertigo, but no nausea vomiting. They may have severe nausea vomiting, but no rotatory vertigo. They may have severe nystagmus, but no vertigo. All these patients you saw with, with significant nystagmus were not very vertiginous. Uh, they did not have subjective vertigo. So one, a loss of proportion and B of course you might get other signs because if it's in the ear you might get hearing loss and tinnitus and if it's in the brain you might get other things which occur next to the western nucleus so you might get diplopia or dysarthria or paresthesia. If it's migraine they might get an aura, they might have risk factors of vascular disease because they may be hypertensive or be having diabetes or that kind of thing. Also importantly, if you have peripheral disease or ear disease, then generally the brain will overtake after a while and correct or suppress the abnormal sensation after a while, so they'll get compensation and get better. Well, if it's a central disease, it will persist for months and months. Peripheral disease will generally get better over two, three weeks, even without treatment. So you put that all together and it's easy to tell as to whether you're dealing with a central cause or a peripheral cause. So we'll, this, we'll see one more boring slide and then we'll go on to some cases. So now, what are the signs? What are the signs that tell you whether you're looking at a peripheral or a, or a central cause? And these are important because they're often MCQs too. So there's a mnemonic to it. We call it HINTS. So HINTS to stroke. So HINTS stand for three tests, head, head impulse, nystagmus, and test for skew. So test for skew is something like doing a test for uh, squint wherein you cover one eye, you cover one eye and you see if the eye moves. So you cover one eye and if the eye moves a bit up or down, then it means that the, that the eyes are not naturally focused at the same thing and the, both the eyes are a little bit different and you have to exert binocular vision to, to get them. You, the moment you, you, you cover one, the eye will go up. That is a skew. You cover this one, the eye will go up or down. And that is skew. And if you have that sign on a patient who's presented with, with acute vertigo, you're probably looking at a central cause than at a peripheral cause. If you have nystagmus, which is classical peripheral type, then of course you're looking at a peripheral type. And if you have a nystagmus, which is the non-classical type, as we just saw, then you're looking at a central cause. And then there is another test, which we call the head impulse test. The head impulse test is a good way of telling us whether or not the, the 
inner ear is involved or not and if you put these three together then with the hands it is said that you can have a very very sensitive evaluation of whether or not the patient has a peripheral cause or a central cause if you're in the casualty if you're a general practitioner or if you're writing an exam our exam or the MLE or whatever and they ask you as to whether this patient has presented and does he have uh, a stroke or does he have something going on with the ear then they will ask you this specific question and it is said that this mnemonic the hints mnemonic is actually more sensitive than an MR this was said a while ago in 2009 of course as diffusion weighted MR has become more and more sensitive this may not necessarily be true but that still doesn't take away the importance of this small mnemonic to try and make sure as to whether you're dealing with a central or a peripheral cause. So remember the mnemonic hints to stroke, he HI is head impulse, N is nystagmus, this is the classical nystagmus and TS is test for skew that I just demonstrated. Let me now demonstrate, it to, you, demonstrate to you the head impulse test. This is the head thrust test. I'll tell you how to read it. You may not want to read it, you may not want to, want to know theory. But anyway, what happens is when you turn the head very rapidly, the inner ear senses the motion and corrects the eye motion. It pushes the eyes to the other side so that your eyes can stay focused on the same points. If I'm looking at one point and if I'm suddenly thrust my s to the other side, my eyes will stay focused on the same point. That's how you and I will balance ourselves. So now, now if you look at this gentleman, you push the head suddenly to the left and to the right. So look at me, so look at him when it goes to the left and then to the right. So we'll do it again. When it goes to the left, the eyes follow immediately. Saw that? Now see it comes with a delay. You saw that? So basically what is happening is that when you turn the head to this side, the other side, When you turn the head to the right, which is the second turn, then the eyes don't come as quickly correcting as they should, which basically means that he's not perceiving on that side. So this is the head thrust side. Okay, normal delay. You saw that delay? So do it again. Normal delay. The, the eyes come back a little bit late. And that essentially is the head thrust test and tells you that this patient is not perceiving in a year motion as well as he should. So hints to stroke, we talked about it. Remember this, uh, hints to stroke, important slide for you, often I uh, MCQ on that. So that's enough. Let me do a few case discussions with you. Let me first check how many of you are still here with me. Oh, good, five of you. So we'll run through a few cases and after each case I would expect you to type me something if you had a question or at least type me your responses and then we'll go to case 2 and case 3. We'll just discuss three scenarios, okay? So here's a 65 year old gentleman, he's an executive. He complains of frequent dizziness and lightheadedness. He says it's worse in the morning, especially when I get off from bed. Sometimes when he goes for his morning walk, he says he has a sinking feeling. He has no positional symptoms. This is important because a lot of vertigo is BPPV, we said, which occurs with a positional turn in head, peripheral. So no positional symptoms. No dysarthria, dysphagia, loss of consciousness. It basically tells you that the area around the vestibular nucleus in the brain stem is not affected. No hearing loss tinnitus, which tells you that the rest of the inner ear may not be affected. Of course, it's not necessary that every neurological cause will come with dysarthria, dysphagia, and it's not necessary that every autological cause with hearing loss and tinnitus. So anyway, here we are. Okay. He has a few comorbidities as they have when they are 65. So he has a mild diabetes. He's quite a, let us say, a quite a, type A personality, 
His strict diet control is losing weight. He's a bit overweight. His diet and hypertension is well controlled. He's hypertensive. He's on salt restriction. He's on beta blockers. So question. So now no further. You have examined him. You examine him. You find no nystagmus. The head impulse test is normal. The vestibulospinal test, this is the Romberg's test and a few other tests we do to assess a normal audiometry which basically means the hearing test is normal. Okay? So, tell me if you go back to this patient and you ask these questions, is it vertigo, is it central or peripheral, how far can you take me? Is it vertigo? Is it central or peripheral? Just read through this again and we'll come back. So, can you write me a note to say as to what you feel about this or can you not? If you cannot, if you can say yes, but don't write a note. Live chat. No? So I think I'll have to do most of the chatting. seem that we will get an interactive thing today. Anyway, so this patient actually has pre-syncope. He doesn't have quite the rotatory vertigo that we talked about. This is pre-syncope. This is uh, because the gentleman obviously has a few comorbidities. He gets up in the morning. He's obviously fasting, so a little bit hypoglycemic. He's quite particular about his diet, so he obviously has a very tight HbA1c, and uh, he has hypertension, so he's on salt restriction, so maybe a little bit hyponatremic or dehydrated. And here you have a patient who's a little bit hypoglycing, a little bit dehydrated on beta blockers, so again, blood pressure doesn't go up too much, they will get some postural hypertension, and you put it all together, and this patient is having pre-syncope, and that's what is really causing him the lightheadedness that he is having. And uh, is it vertigo? Not really. It's really you would call pre-syncope or syncope. And what investigation is most appropriate? Probably nothing. Probably best just to tell him that you get up in the morning, be a little bit slow. Don't immediately rush up and rush for your walk. Get up, sit up a little bit, have a cup of tea maybe. <laughs> and uh, then walk up and go. Maybe have a bite before you go for your walk. And uh, if you really want to be too sure, you could maybe do some hemogram and check his hemoglobin and that kind of thing. But uh, if you are just sensible with him, you don't quite need to take it very much further. So let me take you to another patient. So here's this gentleman who's 62 and he had sudden severe rotatory vertigo which lasted a few days and he had vomiting and he was bedridden for six days. So what does that tell you? It tells you that the rotation and the vomiting and the autonomic symptoms were in sync. They were proportional. No loss of con consciousness, low disorientation, paralysis, sensory abnormalities, diplopia, dysarthria, dysphagia. So what does that tell you? It tells you that probably the brainstem wasn't affected because nothing that you expect around the vessel nucleus is affected. And then he got gradual improvement. He got better within a few days and he started moving around. But he continues to have some transitory vertigo on change in position. So what does that tell you? It tells you that he got better quite spontaneously, maybe with some treatment, but he got better and as we discuss peripheral symptoms or the pathological symptoms generally get better because the brain kicks in and overrides the, 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 the impulses coming from the inner ear 
and they often tend to get better a little bit over time. And of course, illnesses also resolve over time. So gradual improvement, okay. And this hearing test showed some SN loss, sensory neural hearing loss. So that also tells you this might be coming from the ear. So you put it all together and you get the feeling this is something that is happening from the ear. it through him, but uh, our diagnosis what you could call it labyrinthitis because he had vertigo and hearing loss at the same time which lasted a fair length of time and uh, there is also an element of transitory rotatory vertigo and change of position so this is something that generally happens if you have debris in your inner ear or what we call as canalolithiasis or what in clinical terms is what we call as BPPV I'm so sorry about this. So look at this fellow. This is a test we do. We call the Dick Solpike test, and look at his eyes. He, he has an upbeating nystagmus, which is transitory, and then dies away. So benign paroxysmal positional vertigo is a situation where people get a nystagmus and vertigo when they change position, usually when they lie down from a sitting position. So they go to bed and then they lie down and they get this giddiness or they're in the kitchen and they bend down to pick something and then they get a dizziness. Basically it is vertigo, it is uh, gravity and motion getting confused. See him again? Stop, we'll stop do it again. We call this the Dick's Hall Pike okay. maneuver. You should know. Dick's Hall Pike maneuver. And he had nystagmus, which was up beating and which was which lasted uh, for a or rather down beating. He had nystagmus, which was down beating. I'm sorry. The fast component is down. And uh, this nystagmus was uh, in the vertical uh, plane. And this nystagmus was transient. It lasted a few minutes, few seconds, and then stopped, only 30 seconds or so. It often comes with a latency. When you lay the patient down, it doesn't come immediately, but comes after a short period of 3 to 4 seconds. And this is what we call BPPV. So you need to be a little bit aware of this condition because it is often one of the commonest situations and you will find it in your families and you will find it as a doctor that people will talk to you about this and report this problem to you. And from our point of view, we can sort this particular situation a little bit by what we call as a positioning maneuver. You don't really need to know too much about it except to know that it's very effectively treated by an ENT surgeon by the EPLEY's maneuver, E-P-L-E-Y. At least manual. They might ask in an MCQ. Your book will have it for sure. So I'll take you through one other case. So this guy was someone like me, a little bit younger, presented to the hospital 24 hours after onset of vertigo. He said it was vertigo. Was taking a class when he had sudden onset of rotatory sensation which persisted till the presentation went on and on. It was associated with nausea, vomiting, and headache. So when you ask for dysarthria, dysphagia, specifically you ask for these things, a very mild issue maybe, maybe a little bit of fumbling when you are speaking, but nothing major. No tinnitus or hearing impairment. No history of vertigo in the past. Smoker. To put it all together, So the hint is there's a little bit of unclarity of speech because you ask for that symptoms, you ask for the ear symptoms, you ask for symptoms which are with regard to the brain stem or the lower cranial nerves and you ask for symptoms which are as to whether the symptoms of giddiness and vertigo are in proportion or not in proportion. So based on both the, all these things, there's nothing autological, there's minor neurological 
and uh, there is vertigo with nausea. Is it vertigo? Yes. Is it central or peripheral? A little bit of a hint that it might be central. So we examined him, there's mild dysarthria. Extraocular movements were okay. There was mild nystagmus, not very sure. Other gain nerves were, were normal and uh, everything else okay on the neurological examination. So what does this patient have? So basically, as I said, if you have looked at uh, central and peripheral, so you look at symptoms, and on the symptoms there's a mild hint that this might be neurological, and then you go to signs. And the signs we talked about was the hints to stroke. So hints is head impulse, and is nystagmus, TS is test for skew, and the head impulse test was negative. What does that mean? It means that the head impulse test indicated that the inner ear was okay. You get me? The inner ear was okay. And sometimes, of course, in clinical situations, things are not that clear when you start to get worried about a stroke here. So what would you do for this test? You, with this patient, you'll do a cover-uncover test for skew deviation, the hints for skew. You don't quite need this. I don't think you need to get too involved with this, but you will do imaging. And today, the best imaging to do is a diffusion-weighted MR. A CT will generally not show an ischemic stroke on day one even on day three, but the diffusion-weighted MR will start to show something happening within the first six, eight hours. And so diffusion-weighted MR is really what you need. More importantly, you need to continue to follow up this patient because just because there are no signs when you, sp when you saw the patient four hours or one day after presentation doesn't mean there will be no signs a little bit later because things may progress. Just like cardiac ischemia can progress to infarction, similarly, uh, cerebral ischemia can progress to infarction and get worse. So you will admit such a patient, you will keep an eye on the patient, you will re-examine the patient, you get an MR and take it further. So thank you. I would have liked it if you would have interacted a little bit more. Kaise interaction karna bhi hume dikhao, hume toh nahi I'll leave it at that. If there are any questions, you can ask me. Hopefully we can do some questions now if one of you wants to ask. Aye, sir. अगर कोई क्वेश्चंस पूछने हैं तो कैसे पूछने हैं? आहा, so you guys have been answering. आदित्य अग्रवाल said yes. I don't know what it means now, but I'm glad you were thinking. It's nice to have a thinking audience. Not vertigo, not vertigo, not vertigo. So I hope you were all answering the first case. If you're all answering the first case, then most of you were right. आहा, if there's anything else you want. Uh, to say or ask then please do oh well so Aditya said yes and then no Should we say goodbye or are there any questions? I'll wait for 30 seconds because there's a 30 second time lag. Attendance was a telemedicine field. Thank you for being here and uh, take care, take good care of yourself, utilize your time. See you some other day then. Bye. <laughs>